Okay, so I thought we could do a bit of geometry with the, with the kind of thing that we were doing. So I won't do all cases, but maybe with some detail the case of the tetrahedron. And then uh, I'll leave, uh, I'll say something about the cube, but the icosahedron and non decahedron are, are, much, are harder to, to draw and to discuss, so I'll, I'll, I won't. So let's, let's look at the tetrahedron. This is one of the cases that appeared in our calculation. So let me, so let's do it very concretely. So I'm going to define four vectors, which are going to be the vertices of the tetrahedron that I'll pick. So this is in three space. So this is a tetrahedron. You can uh, compute the inner products of these vectors with themselves, and you'll have uh, the all sitting on a sphere or radius of square root of three. And And they all are from the same angle. All the angles between the pairs of vectors is the same. The sum of the vectors is zero. So this the center of mass of this object is, is zero the origin. So I like to see what the symmetries of this, the rotations of this. So there's going to be, so if you recall there were three orbits of poles for rotations and they're going to correspond to um, three kinds of rotations which will be associated to um, to vertices, edges, and faces. So if you take, let's look at the rotations of a vertex, so it'll be four rotations associated to the four vertices. So if you look at a, let's see, um, a vertex like this V1, you can rotate um, a third of a, a, a rotation of order three that will cyclically permute the other three vectors. Yeah. So, for example, so R of V1 sends uh, B, so fixes V1, and it takes V2 to V4. 
to be to be three and to be two. Okay. I mean, they, it would be better to have an actual model, which I don't have. I used to have one made out of cardboard, but I didn't uh, bring it here. So anyway, you should imagine that you're looking at this, um, the vector v1 goes through the origin, and that's the axis of rotation, and it, um, it rotates the, um, the, um, the three vertices around like this. So this uh, axis will hit the middle of the face on the other side. So the face rotations here, in fact, are the same as the vertex rotations in this case. So if we think of what the rotations do to the vertices, so the, see, the, the, we're looking at rotations that take the state or heat to itself, and it will take vertices to vertices, edges to edges, and faces to faces. So we can look at any one of those sets and see that the permutation that it does. So in this case, looking at the vertices is, is a, a, the nicest thing. So as a permutation of the vertices, this is the cycle 2, 3, 4. And um, so three of these vectors are linearly independent. Um, let's see, I want to be careful. Um, yeah, they add up to zero. Um, well, so. If we use the basis uh, v2, v3, v4, um, we get a permutation matrix that uh, permutes these three vectors. So that matrix has trace 0. So you have to compute the matrix, uh, the trace, it doesn't matter what basis you do it. So, so maybe I'll write it down. So in basis V2, V3, V4, we have the rotation that 2 goes to 3, uh, 2 goes to 4. Um, sorry, did I do this right? This would be 2, 4. What did I do? Two goes to four, so it should be two, four, three. Uh, oof, I, this is the permutation of the vertices, two, four, three. Um, the vector two goes to the vector four. Yeah, and vector three goes to the vector two. That's the first. So in, if I pick this basis, the matrix will look like this, and the trace of that is zero. And the same would go with all the other uh, rotations. The other, there are four rotations. So if you look at rotation of vertices, there is uh, each vertex produces uh, two rotations because we have the rotation and its square, so or if one direction or the other direction. I mean, if I don't count the identity, I get eight rotations associated to vertices that are all distinct. And these are the same as the face rotations, so I only get eight rotations from that. And these are order, so these are the order three. 
and I looked at the edge rotations. So what we do is you take uh, the middle point of an edge and join it with the origin. So that's an axis. And we have a rotation uh, around that axis that takes an edge and flips it over. OK? So it changes. So for example, the rotation associated to the, the say the edge one two. So the edge d one with d two, then uh, what the rotation will do is sort of flip these two, and then. Um, will necessarily have to change B3 and B4. So as a permutation of the vertices, this is the, the cycle type 1, 2, 3, 4. OK. And if we, um, if we look at it, so we use the basis B2, B3, B4 to write down a matrix for the other rotation. So we use the same basis. Um, what do we see? So B1 goes to B2 and so let's see. B2 goes to B1 B3 goes to B4, and B4 goes to B3. Now B1 in the basis um, B2, B3, B4, is what? So this vector is, is uh, minus the sum of all the others because the total sum is 0. So this is minus b2 minus b3 minus b4. So b2 goes to this vector. b3 goes to b4. And b4 goes to b3. So the matrix looks like this. So the trace is minus 1. So how many rotations associated to edges do we have? Six. There are six edges. Each rotation is of order two, so there's only one non-trivial. So there's um, one, six, and these are of order two. So let's see. Do we have all the possibilities? We have eight, um, something not quite right. Um, we should get how many? to be a bit careful, we don't really have six because uh, when we do this, um, the middle point of this edge, if we join it with a, uh, to the axis, will hit the middle point of the other edge on the other side. So the fact that it's, uh, it's half of the Yeah. Which other side? Well, there's going to be, there has to be some other side. Um, I don't quite see what the picture is. Probably it will have to be the, the 3, 4, because they give the same. Yeah. So the, the middle point here should, 
picture is not, not very good, but somehow I should hit the, the point 0.34. So each, there are six edges, but we only get three rotations out of them. So the total number then is 8 plus, um, plus 3 plus the identity, which is 12, which is the order of the group that we worked out before. I didn't do the calculation, but we worked out the, so the numbers that could come up for a finite group of rotations. And the first case, if you recall, there were three numbers, n1, n2, and n3, which were 2, 3, 3, for this case. And, uh, and the, if you work through your way through the calculation, you'll see that the number n, which is the order of the group, was 12. So the claim here is that the group G is isomorphic to A4. Um, and this isomorphism is visible by just saying, looking at what the group does to the vertices. So you see, we got, um, well, I only did one of one of each kind, but uh, this corresponded to the, um, the three cycle two four three, which is even, and the edge rotation so V one V two corresponds to one two three four, which is also even, and all the rotations will be of this sort. So they're all even permutations of the four vertices. So in fact, since there are twelve of them, it has to be the whole group. There is no rotation that doesn't do anything to the vertices unless it's the identity. So. And what representation of A4 do we have? Well, um, we can see that the traces are uh, minus 1 for, for the products of two cycles and 0 for the three cycles. So that's the restriction of the standard representation of its 4 to A4. So, um, representation of A4 on R3 is isomorphic to standard representation of A4 So uh, this is just then an illustration of, uh, of the fact that we abstractly worked out that they could potentially be a group with these characteristics. This is um, an example. And in fact, well, there must be a further argument to show that this is the up to conjugation, the only other, the only possible way this group can come up. Any question? OK. Um, let's look at the cube.
again the center of mass is zero. And now we let's count how many rotations we have. Let's start with the vertices, edges and faces. So what kind of rotation do we see on the vertices? So we just look at this, you rotate this, you see something of order three. Yeah, it will flip these three faces. Right, so the, uh, the, pole, this, the axis will go through this vertex to the origin and it will hit the corresponding vertex on the other side. So in fact, um, there's eight vertices, but, um, but only four rotations. Now, these are of order um, these rotations are of order three. So um, in fact, they'll be um, Um, each vertex has, in fact, two rotations, well, one direction and the other direction. But they're, um, so they should be twice that. How about the ones about the edges? How many edges do we have? Do we have 12 edges? Again, if you go through the middle of an edge, you can hit it the corresponding edge on the other side. So it will be a half of 12. And these are order 3. These are order 2. And then, uh, sorry, I, I wrote this in the wrong place. Uh, let's do it here. Uh -huh. Order 3. And the ones on the faces, what do we, we have? Three. Three. Yeah. So there's six faces, but they, again, they come in pairs. And what order are they? Order four. Order four. So there should be, this uh, will have to multiply by by how many they are. So we would have, let's see how many rotations do we half, we have um, one half times eight times, um, well, let me write it as three minus one because there's order three, but there's three rotations, but one of them is the identity. So, and then we have one half times 12 times two minus one, and then one half times six times four minus and then we have the identity. And this is all the rotations that there are. And if I did this right, this should come out to be 24. Okay, so the claim is that G is isomorphic to S4, and then we'll consider what representation it is. So how do we see that this is S4? So we have to see somehow this thing acting on four things, although it's not immediately obvious what four things that those could be. Because there's too many vertices, there's too many faces and edges. Huh? We can choose only four vertices, which are which are general. Yeah, they're gonna they're gonna go to the others. So, 
Or you can look at opposite pairs of vertices. So we can look um, at diagonals. There's going to be four diagonals um, that join opposite vertices. And these are going to, these four diagonals are going to be moved uh, to each other. And so we can see that this thing acts on the four diagonals. And you can check that that will exactly give you an isomorphism with S4. Every non-trivial rotation has to move the sum of the diagonals, and so you will get um, an embedding into S4, and the size is 24. So, okay. so what uh, representation of S4 is it? to work, work it out, it, it has to have, the matrices have to have determinant 1 because they are rotations, and so it's not, it's not, um, so you have to arrange to you have to do is make sure that the um, the determinants of one. So it is not the standard representation, but it's a it's standard representation the time times standard. Uh, sign. So the representation is isomorphic to what we call V prime, which is V. Because the, the, the standard representation of the sign is given by the sign, so the term is given by the sign of the permutations. And um, so if you multiply by the, the, um, the sign because the dimension is odd, then the determinant will uh, come out to be 1. So let me just uh, say one uh, last thing about these two cases. There's somehow there's a way. So we have A4 is acting on the tetrahedron, and S4, which is a subgroup, um, is acting on the cube. And so there's a way to, to see these two things together. So what you can look is uh, look at the say take the vertices and divide them into two classes. Those were the product of the entries is plus one, and those were the product of the entries is minus one. So we have coordinates that have ones with signs. So, um, so the product plus one would be, for example, well, let's write them out, would be one, one, and minus one, minus one, one. Minus one, one, minus one, and one, minus one, minus one. So there's four of them. And these four are going to are exactly the, the vertices of the tetrahedron that we had before. So we have inside here, we have the tetrahedron. So let's see if I get this right. So this would be um, product equal to one. And um, let's see if I can get this right. Um, then uh, I have to change two of them. So, um, well, let's see if I can get this. Oh, that's okay. So it's like to be this. 
this. And uh, that, uh, and probably that. Yes. So the A4 would be uh, the subgroup of S4 removing the cube that preserves these four entries. So the A4 that we have here is the subgroup of rotations of the cube that preserve this tetrahedron. And then there's another tetrahedron um, which corresponds to the product minus one. And so that gives you the two cosets, uh, S4 and A4. So an odd, represent an odd cycle will flip the two tetrahedra and the even ones will keep each tetrahedra fixed. If you look at, um, in terms of permutations, so S4, you can see it as uh, permutations sign permutations um, of three things. Or sort of, let me just say, let me say if it's better. So if you look at what the matrices are, these are uh, permutation matrices with signs. So you also, you permute the coordinates, but you also change sign. And that will give you eight times, uh, so it should be, come out to be 24. Now it will, it will act by means of permutations with um, with signs. Okay. Yeah. So sorry. It says permutation with signs of the time. Missing one thing, I was getting too many. So there's three permutations, uh, there's six permutations in, in R3, that correspond to S3, and then there's uh, eight possible sign changes, but since you want the determinant to be plus one, that will give you only four. So that should be six times four, 24. Okay, so. Uh, we could, in principle, try to do the same thing with the icosahedron and dodecahedron, but it becomes much messier to draw. But there'll be a similar analysis. There'll be edges, ver e faces, vertices, and, and edges rotations, and uh, one could work out the way through that and see that they come up to be the total number that we um, computed before for a possible group of uh, rotations in a in three space. So just for the, just to summarize, let me a little table of um, the, um, the data. So if I look at uh, faces, edges, and vertices of these uh, platonic solids, so we have the tetrahedron, the cube, the octahedron, which are, um, for, from the point of view of symmetry, they're they are the same, they have the same symmetry, dodecahedron and icosahedron. So the tetrahedron has four faces, six edges, and four vertices.
and um, yeah, so the cube has six faces. swaps the F and the V, yeah, the um, Euler formula says that the alternating sum of these things should be 2, and, and the formula is unchanged if you flip the V and F because they have the same sign, and that's exactly what the duality does. Um, there's a geometric way to say what the duality is, but at this level it means swapping F and V. something about the, the other cases to check that we get 60 uh, rotations. So, um, so we have something like this. We have a pentagon. of a icosahedron would be one that has um, the faces are triangles and from a vertex there, there's five of them or am I saying dodecahedron I always get them confused Well, it's one of the two. Um, so, it should be, yeah, it's the dodecahedron, I think, which has, um, yeah, the dodecahedron, where the faces are triangles. So, here, let me just say what the shape of the faces are. So, the tetrahedron, these are triangles. Um, here squares, the octahedrons are triangles, these are pentagons, and these are triangles. So if we look at this, um, a vertex rotation will, will be uh, uh, something of order 5. Yeah, we'll have a rotation that um, from a vertex we'll have to flip these five triangles and meet there. Okay, so there's um, we're looking looking at the dodecahedron. There's twelve of them, but um, again, there's only going to be um, half. Of, the, of these. Okay, and if we look at the edges, there's 30 edges, but again, we only have um, half. And for the faces, we can have uh, again half 20. And so this is the order. This is, or, this is of order 5, the edges of order 2 always, and this is of order 3. So we get uh, 6 times uh, 5 minus 1 plus uh, uh, 15, 2 minus 1 plus uh, 20, uh, 10, plus 3 minus 1 plus 1 and this should come out to be 60. Okay, so the total number of rotations that we can see 
in this in the Dodeca hydrogen 60. And then it becomes a real challenge to find five things that this thing is permuting. It's not at all obvious how from the geometry of this object you can uh, pinpoint five things which um, are giving you the isomorphism of G with A5. So I'll leave it to you to ponder on this not There is some somewhat complicated way to produce a subset, uh, subs a set of five things which the group is permuting. But it's not uh, so immediate as in the other cases. All right, so that's, I think, all I want to say about uh, this. Of course, I've been giving uh, several times a talk about the shape of a football. And the football is, um, you take a dodecahedron and you uh, truncate it. At, so you cut out something like this. And that will give you uh, a pentagon, and then the, faces, the other faces will become hexagons. So now you have a mixture of hexagons and pentagons that make the standard football, which you've probably seen. And, it, and there's 12... Um, Sorry, what kind of football? The one you play football, soccer. It's round? Yeah, it's round, but if you look at the standard Telstar uh, football, it's made out of pieces that are uh, flat. They're, they're made out of leather, and they're, if you cut them out, they're flat. Then you make this, you take this, um, I'm not saying this right because, sorry, I'm getting confused these two. I hope I, you, you, you have to truncate an icosahedron. Uh, yeah. Um, I think I was talking all the time about the icosahedron here. There's 12 vertices, which are triangular. Yeah, it was always the icosahedron. Um, yeah, so in, a priori, what I'm getting is a object that is not a sphere, but if you inflate that, then it becomes a pretty good approximation uh, sphere, and that's what you use to play football with. I mean, then the, the design has evolved and it become much more sophisticated, but the standard football that you probably have in your mind if you ever played is, is a truncated icosahedron. And there's a, so as I said, there's a formula of Euler that says that the number of faces is always equal to 2, if you, because that's the only characteristic of a sphere, or minus the only characteristic. And um, it's a remarkable thing that if, with that formula, if you try to make a, something round, something like a sphere, with only hexagons and pentagons, you always need 12 pentagons, no matter what is it you do. You can have a fairly arbitrary number of hexagons, but they can only be 12 pentagons. And this is the simplest case of that. Well, the simplest case, yeah, is the icosahedron itself, which has no hexagons. But the next simple one would be, um, sorry, the dodecahedron. And the, the, this one will have um, 12 hexagons. Uh, uh, pentagons and 20 hexagons, right? These, um, these faces become hexagons when you cut out the, chop off the corner. And the, and the symmetry group remains the same, so the, the, the ball has, in fact, an icosahedron symmetry group isomorphic to A5. Okay, and uh, I think we worked out what the representation is in that case. So maybe here you can write down what the group of symmetries is. 
this is A4, these two have S4, these two have A5. Okay, so um, just quickly one small comment. Um, we discussed that the group SU2 was isomorphic to H1, the units of H1. Um, the Hamilton quaternions with uh, norm 1. And this has, uh, an, and we then um, also talked about rotation separately, but there is a connection here because, um, so the Hamilton quaternions have basis 1, i, j, k, and there is a conjugation operation, which if the quaternion is u equal to u0 plus u1, u2, u3, it, the conjugate is defined to be changing the sign to all the non-real coordinates, then we have uh, the trace sum, which is twice u0, and then the norm, which is the sum of the squares. So quaternions of, um, of si uh, norm 1 uh, are, are parameterized by the free sphere. Now, there's an operation um, that we haven't mentioned, which is to conjugate the group, the, um, the algebra is non commutative so if you have a quaternion u, it will take um, v, you can consider u v u inverse, so this maps the quaternions to the quaternions, this is a homomorphism of algebras, and in particular um, it will preserve the trace, so this uh, preserves the trace, and which means that um, if we look at the subspace of the quaternions where the trace is zero, It is taken to itself. So, uh, so V is taken over by conjugation by U. And, uh, well, U invertible, of course, so this makes sense. So, non zero. And I can scale uh, u by a real number, and it won't change the rotation. So I might as well, uh, the conjugation, so I might as well just concentrate on, um, on vector um, terms that have norm 1. In terms of conjugation, the, this gives us all possible ones. So this acts on um, g of v by conjugation, and the kernel are the things that commute with everybody that have norm 1, and this algebra, the only things that commute with everything are just the scalars, and so the scalars of norm 1 are just plus or minus 1. Okay. Now this is uh, topologically is the three sphere.
And what it, it happens is that the conjugation not only preserves the trace, but also preserves the norm. So it's not just the case that it gives us an invertible linear map from V to V, that it also preserves, so uh, maybe I'll call this sigma u, just uh, let's call this sigma u. Sigma u preserves also the norm. Hence, uh, and the norm of a vector v, um, so if v is in, in the trace 0 space, v means that it has only, uh, has no real coordinates. So the norm of v is the sum of the squares, which is the standard Euclidean norm on 3 space, V is isomorphic to R3, and so the norm is nothing but the standard norm squared in Euclidean space. And what sigma? This. Oh, okay. So in fact, I can uh, say that this maps into um, O of V, Well, um, which is the same as O3, orthogonal 3 by 3 matrices. And one thing that um, we can check is that, in fact, it has determinant 1. And moreover, this map is actually subjective. So what we have is that the group SL3 of determinant 1 rotations, so in other words, rotations, uh, isometries of three space that have determined one has a, a double cover which is the three sphere and this uh, exact sequence doesn't split in the sense that this group is not the product of this group times this group this is an honest cover and um, this turns out to be something that people that work in video games are interested in, or many other situations, because this gives you a very efficient way to parameterize rotations in three space. You, each rotation, what this is saying is each rotation is given by conjugating by some quaternion, actually two quaternions up to plus and minus one. And you can uh, compute this map sigma u explicitly in this basis you just uh, work out and it's a length, common kind of lengthy calculation and you'll get that if I give you v1, v2 and v3 whose uh, sum is 1, a square is 1, so an element of, of order, uh, norm 1 in the 3 sphere then I, it will correspond to it a rotation and so this is, uh, so this is in fact something that Euler did before uh, quaternions. So this is a parameterization of rotations in three space. And um, in the uh, spirit of saving some time, I won't write down what the final answer is. It's it's a simple thing for you, you can check. Okay, so I think there would be a, a few other things to say about the geometry here, but I want to do one more topic before we end. So I'll just do this somewhat briefly, but this is an important concept that uh, we should at least mention, which is the concept of induced representations. 
So the situation is the following. We have uh, two finite groups, or group and subgroup. So we already mentioned uh, taking a representation and restricting it from G to H. So a row is a representation of G. Then um, we just forget that G exists and consider it only as a map in H, and that gives us this restriction. So that's a fairly um, straightforward thing to do. What is less straightforward is to go somehow the other way. So what we have, so given a representation rho of, of H, we are going to produce a representation which is called the induced representation from H to G of rho. So this will be a representation of G. Okay. Built out of that of H. Now, um, there is a simple conceptual way to do this, but it's somewhat formal. And um, Think of the following. So let, let me call this, um, well, this, yeah, let me call it W. So this will give me a representation of V. Um, so W has an action of H, this, uh, via this row. And I want to somehow associate a representation of G. Now, being a representation of H is to say that it's a module for the group ring of H. So W is in CH module. And to produce a representation of G, I want to produce a CG module. So there is a natural thing that we can think of doing, which is to take a tensor product. And I wanted to be very careful because this is non commutative. So I'll just write it this way just to, to say, I mean, so this is a left uh, CH module. And CG is a right uh, CH module just by the fact that H is a subgroup of G. And then this, you can form this uh, tensor product and you will find a CG module. And that's uh, formally how you define the induced representation. But this is uh, not very satisfying because it's a little hard to understand what is it that one is doing. So a, a bit more, less formal, a bit more concrete is to do the following. We take V to be this vector space of functions from G to W, just functions. G is a finite set and W a vector space. That satisfy the following that f of h um, x, so um, is equal to h of f x. 
So x is an element of the group. So an h, so x is in g, and h is in h. So I can suddenly make, make sense of h times x. That's the product in the group. And the product h times f of x makes sense because f of x is somebody in w. And so I can act by h. So this is a, uh, these are linear conditions that we're imposing on, on the function. So this is a vector space. It's a subspace of all functions from g to w. And so at the moment, this is just a vector space. But I want to define an action of g. And the trick is to do the following. If you have an element of g of the group and a function f on this vector space v, then you define g f as the function which at the, at the, at the x is equal to f x times g. So inside the function, we have group elements. So it makes sense to multiply x times g, as it did here. It's just uh, now we're multiplying on the right. And um, the thing to notice is that by because we're multiplying on the right, the condition to be in the space f, it remains valid. Because if I replace x by xg, then uh, this identity still be true for every h because the h and the g don't interact with each other. So this um, procedure does take uh, a function in v to a function in v. So this belongs to v. And it gives us a linear map. And so we get an action of g on the vector space v. And we can see that the vector space w, we can embed it into v by taking, if we have a vector in our space w, we can um, produce a function by the recipe that if we have an element h in h, we send it to h times w. So this is h is in h. And if um, h is not in h, we should simply to send it to 0. So we should be able to verify that this is a function in v. So if I multiply this, uh, the argument by some h in h, this is going to be the case, and if somebody is not in H, multiplying it by somebody in H will not make it land in H, because it's a subgroup. So if somebody is not in H, it gets assigned the value 0. If I multiply it by an H on the left, it will still not be in H, so it will be mapped to 0, and H times 0 is 0. So this is, in fact, uh, an embedding of the vector space into V. So this, uh, this uh, induced representation is somehow a bigger thing that has, a, it will have, we can think of it as having slices that are like W, and it has one slice, which is uh, sort of W itself. OK, so this still is a bit, um, is a bit um, hard to follow what exactly this is. 
to give it into a um, a more concrete description we can do the following so this is a bit messier but at least it's more concrete and we get a, a somewhat better sense of what is going on we're going to form V our induced representation as a direct sum of copies of W where sigma runs over the cosets g over h. So I'm not assuming h is normal. So this is just cosets. So for one for I take a, a copy of W indexed by a coset. And if you think of it, what's going on here, um, the functions have to be uh, completely determined on cosets. Because if I know the value in X, I also know the value on H times X. So these functions are not constant necessarily over cosets, but they are completely determined on each coset. And this is, uh, so you should think of, if I take the identity coset, this will be this embedding here. And then there will be um, so different layers according to the various uh, cosets. Okay, and so this is my vector space, and now I want to define an action of G on this. And that will be this induced representation. And um, so let's say, so pick G sigma to be representatives of the coset. So for each coset sigma, let's pick a G sigma that represents it. So, given a, an element of the group, I want to say how it acts on this space. So you should think of, so the way we should think of this is that we have a sum of a sigma of G sigma times W, so to speak. Right, I haven't... I don't know how an element in general acts on W, but just formally, I'm creating these slices indexed by, by this um, representative. So if I have a G, how should, I, how should it act? Well, um, G times G sigma is going to... Um, give me, if, uh, sig is, if G sigma was in a certain coset, G times it would be in some other coset. So I'm using right coset. So this is G tau for some other coset. But then, not necessarily going to hit exactly the representative that I pick. It, could, it, will just have, it will have to be of this form, where H is an H. So I guess this H depends both on sigma and on tau, but I'm not writing the, the, that in the notation. Yeah? So this A, everything here at the moment depends on the choice of representatives. So thinking of it in this form, 
if I now have a vector v, which is formally a sum of the form um, g sigma w sigma, sigma runs over, always over cosets, then I will define g v if, if this if this is uh, to work out, we should have this happen. But g, g sigma is uh, g tau h. And I do know what to do with h. Yeah? Because w is an h representation. So I, I can make sense of h times any vector in w. And V sigma, these are all, all these are copies of W. So H acts on each one of them, um, and we know how. Okay, so what we do is then define G um, the action of G by this this formula. In other words, you say g times okay. So let's try to understand what this is saying. I take a, a vector v in this is there sum. It consists of a of various vectors indexed by sigma, yeah? And so, on one hand, we have that multiplication by g will move the cosets around. It takes a coset sigma to a coset tau, yeah? So the vector in my v that was in location sigma is now going to move to location tau, yeah? By the permutation that sigma goes to tau. But that's not the only thing we do. That would just be permuting uh, the cosets. We also act by this h on the vector. So we simultaneously permute the coset and act by this sort of residual h that we have here. So it's a mixture of permutation representation on the cosets together with what h does. So, I mean, if I wrote all the symbols, it would be very messy. So, um, I'm not writing that H depends on both sigma and on tau, on our choices. Okay, and this, I claim that this uh, exactly matches everything else that we did before, the two different ways of defining a bit more conceptually what induced representation is. And um, there's yet another way to do this, even more conceptually, which is sort of giving it in terms of a universal property that it has. But that also makes it even more obscure. As usual, the conceptual definitions are useful for various formal discussions, but in practice, it, they may be very complicated to understand. So maybe I'll just state what the universal property is. So W is a representation of H, and U is a representation of G. H is a subject of G, as we have. And so we say U is the induced representation from H to G of W. Well, no, I'm, I'm stating this is, this is what we have. Then any phi um, which is a map from V to W to U 
which is h linear. So w is an a, a representation of h, u is a representation of g, and in particular is a representation of h. So this map extends So I think no, this has sort of been V, excuse me. So U is an arbitrary representation of G and V is our induced. So any H linear map uh, extends to a unique G linear map from uh, so phi, let's say phi tilde from V to you. So V is uh, this W has an is sitting in there. So this is the universal property is a V representation that has the property that any such linear map extends unique. And with these things, um, the uniqueness of such an object is clear, and the question is to actually prove that it exists. And a, a way to encode what we're just saying here is that any H map from the restriction of U to, from G to H, which would be what this phi, where phi lives, is naturally the same as home of G from the induced representation from H to G W to U. Reciprocity, that uh, tells you that if you take the induced representation character and pair it with the character of a U, these are two characters of G, so I'm indicating the G there to emphasize that this is happening as representations of the group G, this inner product is the same as the uh, character of W uh, paired with the restriction of U. And now I put an H to indicate this right-hand side is up happening on the group H. Okay. So this statement becomes this when you relate inner products of class one of characters with the dimensions of home. And so this is a very useful fact and this construction of induced representations is um, is a very uh, is one of the tools that we have to sort of build representations out of, uh, of groups out of subgroups. And uh, so, as an example, we have H is subject of G. So if W is the trivial representation, so it's a one dimensional representation, then when we did this definition of, of the action of G, there was this, if you recall, we had, we had this, we chose our representatives, and then we had this type of thing, and then we had to use the action of H in the, in the copy of W, of index sigma, to define how G acts, 
But if the representation is trivial, then the h doesn't matter. And so um, we have v is a direct sum of w sigmas we had before, um, and g of a g sigma w sigma is g tau h w sigma, but uh, h acts trivially, so this is simply h g tau of w sigma. And so, and w sigma is just a scalar. We are in dimension one for w. So all we're simply doing is uh, taking the coordinate that was in location sigma and moving it to location tau. And so this is just the permutation representation that comes out of uh, cosets. So left multiplication on, on cosets gives us a permutation of cosets. And this gives a linear representation, and that's none other than the induced representation. So if you induce the trivial representation from H to G, you get uh, this representation, the permutation representation. So in general, we induce things that are non-trivial, and it's a mixture, as I said before, of this permutation of courses together with how uh, the age acts via the representation you have down there. So maybe also, I should mention that what's the dimension of the induced representation? Each one of these vector spaces has dimension w. They're all copies of the same. And then as many as in the index. So this is the index of h times the dimension of w. OK, so you start with a small dimensional representation, and you get a big one. And notice here, if this the rep permutation representation on cosets is of dimension the index. And here we start with something dimension one. So it's dimension one times the index. So uh, I will give you a few exercises to work on. And I'll give you an example to work out by hand what this uh, representation is. I think the only way to really understand it is to go over an example. So, but let me just only briefly end with the following. If you look, so one thing you can think of is if you look at the Rubik's Cube, which I'm pretty sure you must have played on this scene. Um, if you look at the uh, cubies in the, in the corner, uh, whatever it is that you do, they're going to be taken to other, other cubies in the corner. Okay? So the group of, of uh, permutations of the cubics that you uh, have available from the physical uh, const uh, constraints of the, of the cube will take uh, the corner cubies to the corner cubics and the non-corner cubics themselves. So it, it, it breaks up into two sets. But notice that uh, if you, if you uh, ever try this, is that the, the cubes don't just go from corner to corner, but they also possibly get uh, rotated. Yeah. So what we have is this phenomenon that we had before. So we call that G acting on G sigma W sigma is G tau with H W sigma. So sigma and tau, think of them as uh, corners in the cube. The G will take corner sigma to corner tau, but at the same time also possibly twist 
the little QB by an element of order 3. So here we have a subgroup of order 3, which is the rotations of these, um, all these uh, things. In fact, you can't quite arbitrarily just do one. I mean, they're, they have, they're connected somehow. There's, you, there is a, there is a, um, a relation between the rotations of each vertex. So I'm just giving you a, trying to give you a physical sense of this, not a precise statement, but just the idea that what is going on here is simultaneously a permutation together with an action. That the action comes from a, the, the subgroup, not from the whole group. The group kind of simultaneously permutes and acts by the subgroup. Okay? All right, so that uh, is all we have. And uh, I will still have to schedule the final, I'll let you know. And uh, I will send you some uh, exercises to work on.